Okay, I think we can get started right about now. Welcome everyone to the fifth annual Lakewood Chamber of Commerce Pachachka Night. This year we will be hearing from four exciting speakers with stories of risky business. Tonight's speakers will be Ian Andrews, Executive Director of Lakewood Alive, Carol Barrett from Carolyn Salon Plus, Corey Streets from Lakewood High School, and Steve Mika from STEM Handmade Soap. Tonight's event would not be possible without the support of Cox Business. But before we get to our sponsor, let me just tell you a little bit about how um, the night's gonna go and a little bit of uh, history and background about Pachachka. Um, just a few Zoom housekeeping items so that you know how to participate in today's event. Only our Pachachka event team and risky business presenters will have video and audio capacity during tonight's event. The Pachachka 20 by 20 presentation format is fun and fast paced. Each speaker has 20 seconds to discuss, discuss each of their 20 presentation slides. Please don't distract them. Um, they've been brave enough to come up here, um, so please don't chat them, just sit back and enjoy. Uh, between each speaker, we'll play a little risky business movie trivia. Um, to answer the question, simply type your guess into the chat box, and the first person to answer correctly will win a prize. Um, the prizes were donated by the Lakewood Chamber of Commerce and Lakewood Vineyard Church. Uh, we'll, re we'll be recording tonight's presentations, and we'll share the video link uh, with all of you after the event. Um, if anybody is ever, hasn't heard of Pachachka, it's, it began by basically people just talking too much. Uh, in 2003, yearning for more show, less talk, two architects from Tokyo invented the 20 by 20 format. Their initial purpose was to streamline long design presentations. The sessions soon morphed into happenings called Pachachka Nights, first in Tokyo, then around the world. Today, more than 50,000 people present at over a hundred, or I'm sorry, over a thousand uh, global Pachachka nights every year, and the number keeps on growing. Today, schools and businesses use Pachachka to creatively and effectively engage students and employees on a range of subject matters. We're happy to partner with Pachachka Global to bring you tonight's event and encourage you to visit pachachka.com to view presentations from all around the world. At this time, I'd like to int introduce Kurt Hochberg from Cox Business, this evening's sponsor. Uh, they're on muted. Welcome everybody and good evening. My name is Kurt Hochberg and I'm your local account executive at Cox Business. And Cox Business is proud to sponsor the Lakewood Chamber Speaker Series. We know that all too well that events have caused a pivot to a different format and we're happy to be able to connect and network virtually with all of you tonight. I've been with Cox for the past seven years and my favorite part about being with Cox is being able to meet with customers, prospects, and discuss their business so that we can provide a solution that is not cookie cutter in a more consultative manner. Cox is a family owned company and we were founded in the state of Ohio in 1898 when James Cox purchased his first newspaper, the Dayton Evening News. The company continued to grow from there Cox Business offers voice, data, TV, and managed cloud services. We partner with a range of clients from retailers to small businesses, to Fortune 500 companies, healthcare providers, government agencies, and more. The part I wanna to touch on this evening quickly is our cloud services, which are powered by rapid scale technology. We offer a complete portfolio of cloud services to help manage your day-to-day -day monitoring, maintenance, integration, backup, and security of IT infrastructure. We also offer a free monthly webinar on various cloud solutions. Each month we select a different topic and have a different cloud expert present the information. It's educational, informative, and you don't need to be a Cox customer to attend. 
it's something that we started to raise awareness as businesses look for new solutions for operating within this pandemic. I'd like to end by wishing good luck to tonight's presenters and kick this back over to Andrea. Thank you so much, Kurt and Cox, Cox Business. Um, next, or first up is Ian Andrews. Uh, thank you so much, Ian, for, for coming here to be with us tonight. We can't wait to hear your story. Thank you, Andrea. Okay, Lauren, uh, if we are ready to go, let's, um, let's take it away. All right, everybody. So, a wine and craft beer festival. Sounds fun, right? Beverages from all corners of the country, local food, outdoor venue at the end of summer. What a blast. Uh, and what it would take to run something like that. Tonight, I'm talking about the Liquid Wine and Craft Beer Festival because special events can be risky business. Some of you might remember this event. Our guests had a lot of fun, but it became a beast to pull off. In 2012, we started that discussion with that merchant group you saw there in our former basement space. After a lot of research and discussion, we landed on a Wine and Craft Beer Festival as a fundraiser and a way to bring more people into the district. We set it for September 2013, a massive undertaking, but it also had significant potential for ROI on the fundraising side. Had a committee help us to brainstorm, recruit volunteers, raise sponsorship dollars, and then we talked our landlord into letting us host the event on the rear of his property, uh, the parking lot behind the INA building, both the first floor and the upper levels. We worked with breweries, distributors. We had 29 different breweries and wineries, distributors, and support from a local wine store. Had 100 different beers, 50 different wines from across the globe uh, and around the country. 120 tables for wine and beer um, uh, for folks to enjoy. 10 different food vendors, all local restaurants. Uh, and sold about 1,500 tickets, uh, both general admission and VIP. Here you can see uh, daytime, year one, 2013. Here's our Wine and Craft Beer Festival School. We set up the night before and then finished and worked all day Saturday. So a long day Friday, all day Saturday into Sunday. VIP tent games, food, wine, beer, ice truck, porta potties, the whole nine. Beautiful weather, major success, packed venue. Teardown lasted till 2 or 3 a.m. Sunday morning. We made it happen. It was a blast. Look at this picture. What a cool shot in downtown Lakewood. We netted over $28,000 from this event. It was the most from any event that we'd ever uh, hosted at that point in time. And at, at that time, our organization was about eight years old. I remember just totally being in the zone when, and it came up to knocking out task after task. And somebody stopped me and said, we're having a blast and you look super stressed. And I was because we wanted to make sure that everyone had a good time. 2014, much of the same, good weather, sold out, saw a 51% increase in revenue, but an 87% increase in expenses and 21% increase in our net proceeds. That expense piece started getting me worried. Here we are, 2015, raining at setup. This is Friday night, had a bunch of people help us out. This is the picture, if you can see it. That is a water spout or possibly a tornado. Uh, I thought it was a water spout. The sirens didn't go off. This was happening right as the gates were about to open for the event in 2015. And I was frozen. I didn't know what to do. Uh, and my heart sank. Uh, and I, um, and we had to go. So, uh, and rain can ruin an event. And there's the rain. Uh, ticket sales, we had a decrease because some people did look at the forecast and decided not to come to the event. Uh, so that kept some folks away. But you know what? People still had fun. Uh, once the event's rolling, you just get, you know, kind of zoned into the event, do everything you possibly can do to help make sure everyone uh, is having a good time. You can see here's our food area with melt bar and grilled. In the background, you can barely see a refrigerated truck. This was new infrastructure because we had so much product, we had to keep it cold for our guests while also still renting an entire 18-wheeler of ice. Uh, we had two of those refrigerated trucks. More infrastructure, more expense. 100 volunteers, many worked two shifts. Uh, because some people just didn't show up. They're volunteers. They can make that choice, which sadly uh, impacts those who are there. So we had a lot of folks who gave up their entire night to help us out. Uh, but we also had some folks who chose to drink uh, and consume uh, more beer than they should have or to take advantage of the situation. Uh, for the financials, it finally did clear up a little bit. Revenue, we saw a 39% increase, up to $110,000 gross revenue. At that time, that was 25% of Lakewood Alive's entire operating budget, everything we do. That's a lot for one event and expenses went up 84%. Keep in mind that expenses do not factor in staff time and the net actually went down 20% from the year before because it rained. Here you can see all the porta potties, 
all the infrastructure associated and look at that, there are uh, some decent gaps. So not as many people and a lot of infrastructure, all of those tents, you got the band, uh, everything that it took to pull that off started getting much more expensive. Here we are, year four. Setup was beautiful, but the forecast was ominous. Ticket sales were going down significantly as folks looked at the forecast and going into the event, we only sold about 1,000 tickets, including uh, 200 VIP, leaving 800 unsold. And I was really worried because I saw how much we were spending reading the tea leaves. Didn't look good. This just shows you an example of inside of one of the refrigerated trucks, all the product that we have. Fun fact, not so fun. If you open up a box of beer, but you don't open the cans or the bottles, you can't return it. It doesn't matter. The box has been opened. So then you're stuck with the product. So we had volunteers who they were trying to get things ready for people who just didn't show up. We couldn't return the product and get our money back. Uh, the three weeks before the event, staff stopped all projects. It was all hands on deck to do everything we could to pull the event off. And it really kind of felt like a runaway train with rain in the forecast. And then it started raining. Then a storm blew in right as the gates were about to open. We had to evacuate our volunteers into the parking garage. I can recall walking through the venue being soaked and very sad. And then here, our new marketing manager told me he was shocked by a lightning strike that hit a few blocks away, traveled through a Liquid Alive tent that he was holding down and shocked his arm. Uh, at this point, I really honestly just couldn't wait for the event to be over, but I knew we had a ton of work to do so our guests could have a good experience. In the VIP tent, folks were having a good time staying dry. We had volunteers that you could see. We had to call in a lot of favors to get people to show up and work the event because a lot of people backed out. That was really challenging. Here, we're underneath the parking garage. We just took over the space, strung some lights, put in some tables to get people out of the rain. But you know what? It became so packed that it uh, got a little stinky. Uh, and then the rain flooded the garage. So it didn't really matter what we did. This is one of my favorite shots. This is Chris Bergen. He's a local realtor. That thumbs up right there. That's the can do. You're going to get through this. We're all having a good time. We believe in you and, and you as an organization, not me and Lakewood Alive. You guys are doing good. Keep it up. Keep working hard. And I knew we were going to get through it. In the end, folks had a great time. But you know what? We saw a 16% decrease in revenue, an 11% increase in expenses. And because we sold so few tickets, 102% decrease in revenue year over year. Our committee was passionate about keeping this going, but we just couldn't. The financial risk was far too significant. We had to pull everyone off their projects. We budgeted a $30,000 net gain for our entire organization for that event. Not only did we lose that, we actually lost another 700 bucks. Took a year to dig out of that hole. In the end, we had to scrap the event. It was far too risky. 2016 compared to 2013, revenue up 73%, expenses up 286%. Keep in mind, no time did that include staff or pay. Risky business indeed. Holy cow. I'm stressed just hearing you talk about that, Ian. Thank you so much for presenting that. Uh, well, my, I know my wife, uh, this is Jason, I'm, the current, I'm the current chair of the Lakewood uh, Chamber of Commerce, and my wife, Amy, and I volunteered at the event a number of years, Ian. And uh, you could hear the stress in your voice, man. I feel for you. That's uh, tough times. But thank you for sharing that with us today. And um, I know a lot of people uh, joining us today probably attended the event. And it, we just really appreciate you going with us today. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Mike. Well, we're we're going to transition to some risky business trivia now. Um, so if it, if you can go to the chat icon on the bottom of your screen, what we're going to do, um, Risky Business it, movie, Tom, there's a great picture here of Tom Cruise in his shades. I actually have the white t-shirt on and my Cox uh, Business, our sponsor today, glasses, so I guess I could put those on here. Um, we're going to ask some trivia questions about the movie, Risky Business. It came out in 1983. And there's an iconic scene um, of Tom Cruise sliding across his, uh, his uh, dining room uh, into kind of the uh, hardwood floor hallway. And basically, it's a movie about a senior in high school. His parents go away for a couple of days. And I'll go through a short synopsis as we do the trivia. Um, but the first trivia question is, in the iconic scene, when Tom Cruise slides down the hallway, and start singing old time a rock and roll while his parents are gone on vacation. Um, go ahead and put in the chat, what household item is he singing into? It is not a microphone. It is another household, I've seen broom, hairbrush. That's not correct. Keep guessing, it's an iconic scene. Every, oh wait, Tyler, 
I think I saw it. We had a candlestick. Candlestick is the correct answer by Tyler Potter. So, um, Patty, do you have a, uh, uh, can you record that? And uh, thank you. You got the first trivia question correct. Correct. I think the common guess is normally a hairbrush. Second guess is a broom. Um, but Tyler was all over that with a candlestick guess. Um, so you're going to win a Risky Business DVD, um, some gift cards from some local merchants, and a uh, pair of sunglasses. So congratulations on that. Um, we're going to do more trivia questions between the speakers. So please, just like that, go ahead and chat in the answers. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea to introduce the next speaker. Great job on the trivia, Tyler. Our next presenter is Carol Barrett, and Carol is the owner of Carol Lynn Salon Plus. Take it away, Carol. Thank you, Andrea, very much. Hello, everybody. Lauren, let's get started. Do you remember your first few days of junior high school? Let me tell you about mine. Picture this, an 11-year-old girl attending school on the west side of Cleveland, forced to a whole nother universe on the east side of Cleveland, with not a choice or a voice in this decision. That was risky business. I had to take a bus to that public school, sometimes a rapid. I did not like it, it was very bad. Turned out to be a blessing though, it changed my life forever. On that bus, I met Rose. She was a beautiful, kind, friendly lady, also a hairstylist. Rose, here she is. Again, she was kind. She volunteered to teach me how to do my hair. Coming from a multiracial home, no one could do my hair. So she invited my parents to bring me to her house and taught us how. That was a risk because she was a stranger and now a friend. Having natural curly hair, and it was thick and curly, Rose chose to do a chemical relaxer on my hair. It made my hair so manageable, so wonderful, straight. For the first time ever, my hair blew with the wind. I felt beautiful. It was great. Lovely lady. If you recall, I mentioned that school was hard for me. It was not fun, not easy. I didn't want to do it. I was really in danger of failing. Fortunately, my parents found a way to transfer me to the Lakewood school systems, and I was ready for that risk. After getting my grades up, the opportunity presented itself for me to take a vocational class that was cosmetology my junior and senior year. I wanted to become a hairstylist so I could make people feel great, just like Rose had done. That was a risk, and it paid off. I found my lifelong passion. This is my sister, Diane, my favorite sister. Please don't tell the others, I have four. Diane helped me with my cap and gown. She was an inspiration to me always, and she made sure that I got to this point right here, and that was graduation. And she's wearing my favorite color, yellow. One of the most important days of a girl's life is prom, and I was no exception. My sister, my parents, and Rose, they all inspired me. And that night, I felt like the prettiest girl in the room. Little did I know that that was just the beginning of the good times to come. After high school, I started my family, and I was blessed with two beautiful boys. Although, by ultrasound, one was supposed to be a girl. Ah, oh, they were wrong. I did get married, and unfortunately, a divorce. In those trying times, the light at the end of the tunnel was my career, and I could see still a bright future. My first stop in my career path, the first salon built my speed and my skills. The second was to build my interpersonal and relationship abilities. And the third prepared me for owning my own business and to take that risk. After all, risky business. After my divorce, one of the ways I occupied my time was to swim at the YMCA while my boys played basketball. A chance encounter with another swimmer, she gave me the information about a loan program that the city offered to open small businesses. I could see right then and there the opportunity to own my own. Once the loan was approved, it was on like Donkey Kong. I was so excited, I was nervous, I was shopping, I bought supplies and everything you would need 
for a salon from the ground up. The next thing was to find the location. Here in Lakewood, of course. And here it is. Located in the heart of Uptown Lakewood on Madison Avenue, my salon is surrounded by coffee shops, restaurants, bookstores, very accessible by bike, by car. And of course, Lakewood is known to be a very walkable community. Walking through my bright blue door, you will find that it's a breath of fresh air. Very welcoming, clean, and spacious with six working stations for hair, and it gets really exciting and loud at times with laughter. We also have areas for manicures, pedicures, and spa services. The look, looking back over the 20 years that led me here to be my own owner, this is a vintage look at my storefront, and it is my favorite reflection on our hometown feel and our community here on Madison Avenue. It's lovely, great neighbors. The inside of the salon is complete. The outside is done as well. Now it's time to celebrate with a ribbon cutting ceremony and a grand opening with the Lakewood Chamber of Commerce, the mayor, my employees, and with the love and support of my family. It's a lot of fun. Along with my service to my clients, making them look and feel their best, my community means a lot to me as well and they have shown me their love. In 2018, I was awarded Outstanding New Member for the Chamber, and then 2019, Chamber's Bright Star. Celebrating and thanking my community and clients and friends, we offered food, fun, same-day spa services, discounts, and more, and celebrated 10 plus years and counting on another 10. Plus, Marilyn Monroe is quoted here as saying, there is no better therapy than sitting in your stylish chair. This is so very true. I love listening to countless ups and downs. I have listened, highs and lows, lost many along the way. It has been an honor to provide comfort to many. I do cherish the friendships and the opportunity to learn, grow, and lead. As a person with so many wonderful people around me, to be truly trusted with their appearance and enhance their beauty inside and out. This truly is a risky business that I love. Thank you. Wow, Carol, thank you so much. Um, I love the way you just, you're such a great storyteller. Just thank you so much. That was really, I've learned so much more about you today. I just really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And just what a wonderful story. You should write a book, I think. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, we're gonna go on and do our second trivia question now. Um, so if you can get the chat button ready, go ahead and click on the chat, get your icon lined up and the type message here, and we'll see who's gonna win our second uh, trivia question. So going further in the story, as I mentioned, uh, Tom Cruise's, his character in the, in the movie, by the way, I guess this could have been a question, is Joel Goodson. So he's playing the good son in this movie. And after his parents go away and he dances around the house, um, there's a point in the movie where his dad tells him not to take his car out. Uh, but of course, uh, Joel, the Tom Cruise character, does take the car out. And at one point in the movie, um, it starts rolling. The emergency brake actually gets knocked off. The movie takes place in Chicago. And the car rolls and rolls and rolls, goes down a pier and falls into Lake Michigan. Now the question is, what type of fancy car is it that he takes out on the town? Oh, we got one in. Terry Pope was the first one to get it in. It was a Porsche. We had Corvette, Diane. Diane Helbig was about half a second late, but Terry Pope is the winner of the second trivia question. Congratulations, Terry. Andrea, I'll kick it back to you now. Great job, Terry. All right, next up, it's Lakewood High School Intervention Specialist, Corey Streets. Take it away, Corey. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here tonight. Uh, Lauren, let's do this. Does the global pandemic have your students stuck in a rut? Are you feeling the quarantine blues and the burn of normal remote learning? 
But does going back to regular school feel too risky? Well, that's our business here at the Mr. Street Center for Remote Education. Seems longer than 20 seconds. Several years ago, during the summer of 2020, I realized that with a new baby on the way, I would need the ultimate at-home workspace in order to be able to balance the needs of my family with the demands of my career. I also had a wide open schedule, lots of free time, generalized anxiety, and plenty of excess materials. Without delay, I emptied out the shed, held a yard sale, and purged the junk I hadn't even touched in several years. I withheld a before photo because it would be simply too shocking. What had been a normal, unassuming storage shed began its transformation from a dingy spider shack to the luxurious educational studio you see here today. No shed-based educational delivery suite is complete without a fully stocked and technologically supported workspace. At the state-of-the-art Mr. Street Center for Remote Education flagship facility, all of our technology generally works and we boast a stable internet connection for up to 68% of the day. We're always expanding here at the MSC FRS. Broccoli Dan, for example, is joining the team as an intern this week. Broccoli Dan brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to his new job. He'll be sitting with the other interns in the sandbox outside. We've added Broccoli Dan to the staff directory, so please welcome Broccoli Dan to our team. Finally, I would like to introduce myself. I am Mr. Streets, the founder and current director of the Mr. Center, Mr. Street Center for Remote Education. And I have more than 12 years of experience teaching special education in a wide variety of circumstances ranging from in-person to not in-person. Now I know what you're thinking and no, I am not a professional actor. Nonverbal communication accounts for the majority of information we send and receive to others. Therefore, at the Mr. Street Center for Remote Education, I take time every day to master the subtle art of producing natural yet effective facial expressions 100% of the time. Now that you know some of the history and background of the Mr. Street Center for Remote Education, I would like to talk about some of the risks inherent in the business of turning your shed into a remote learning studio. As with any project, personal or professional, when you decide to invest your time and energy, there are risks that you know and some that you don't. Who knew, for example, that 2020 would have been full of so many surprises? The picture here is a fairly accurate visual representation of how March and April felt for just about all of us. Of course, about 10 years have passed since then and we have moved into our next phase. This is fine. No, really, it's fine. Remote learning is going to be great and I'm totally prepared and I even have a shed that was in the Washington Post. The Washington Post, for crying out loud. This is going to be great, even with all of the risks. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Oh, yeah, I, I forgot about fire. What if all of my hard work and all of my stuff goes up in flames? Well. First of all, that seems completely in line with 2020, so I guess no one would be surprised. Good thing I have a hose, but that has to be the extent of the risks, right? I mean, come on. Oh yeah, except for maybe thieves. Uh, admittedly, it was a little risky to put myself and my shed out there, but I wanted to celebrate remote learning with my students and get them excited, so it seemed worth it. The security camera and alarm were also worth it, but there can't be more risks than that, right? Dang it, I forgot. It gets a little chilly around here in the fall and winter, and who knows how long we may or may not be remote. I honestly never expected to risk getting hypothermia while teaching. I guess it's time to insulate the roof, buy some thermal socks, and mitigate all of my risks once and for all. Hold up. You mean to tell me that screen fatigue is real? What in the actual heck, 2020? We're only about three weeks in and sometimes it feels like it's been months. I was not aware that I might be risking my general sanity out here in the Mr. Street Center for Remote Education. Well, at least that's all of them, right? Oh, and I guess I do run the risk of spending a little extra time out here, but come on, there's an Xbox in a shed. 
As I tell my students, it's important to find time for the things you enjoy, especially during stressful times like these. In my experience, it's crucial to risk taking time for yourself. When running a, a center for remote education, you risk feeling the burn and tedium of isolation. Having access to a green screen and other fun tools can at least provide you with moments of levity that might just give way to creativity and productivity. Now that I think about it, there are plenty of positive risks worth taking too. You might just run the risk of developing new and diverse connections with people in ways you never even imagined. It is critical to accept the challenges of our time and find ways to make the most out of our circumstances. Even though we might not be seeing people as many, uh, as many people as we like in person right now, it's important to remember that we can and should still connect with others. It's also important to consider how all of the risks that we have to take these days may impact others. I find that if your starting point comes from a position of caring and kindness, the rest falls in line. We can then better protect our families and give young people the tools they need to make their lives in the world a better place. You may even find a creative outlet for skills and interests you never knew you had. In summary, we can't always control any given situation, but we can control how we react to them and what we choose to do with the challenges set before us. With a mindset of community and compassion, we can use our talents to get people excited about the educational opportunities all teachers provide, whether in the school building, at the kitchen table, or in a shed. Finally, this is my daughter who insisted on being in my presentation and wants you to know that she is a princess, but will one day be a queen when she's older. She also says there are too many bees out here, so that's risky as well, but risks or not, I wanna thank everyone for spending some time with me in my shed tonight. It's been quite the experience. Thank you very much. Corey, thank you so much. I just want to let you know I laughed out loud four times. Uh, okay. It was fantastic. I, I wish we could have been doing that live. It, amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, of course. Anytime. Thanks love, for having me, guys. Love the humor. Love the story. And I'm going to have my kids. Uh, I have four remote kids at home right now, two college, a high schooler, and a middle schooler. And I'm going to have them watch this link when the chamber posts it tomorrow. Uh, I think they're really going to appreciate your presentation. Thank you so much for sharing that. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Yeah, that was great. Um, okay, get the chat ready. We're going to do a third trivia question. Um, so um, Tom Cruise, the movie came out in 1983. And I'd, I'd like you to guess... Um, how old Tom Cruise was. He was playing a senior in high school, but how old do you think Tom Cruise was in the movie? We've got 18, 15, 23, 26. No one's got it yet. He was playing a senior in high school. It was his first real big hit. Oh, we got a winner, 21. Diane Helbig got it that time. Diane Helbig is the winner. Steve Cru or Tom Cruise was 21 years old when he played Joel Goodson in Risky Business. Diane, congratulations. I think that was the 13th guess. So by law of averages, someone probably should have gotten it sooner, but congratulations, Diane, you got the answer correct. Andrea, I'm gonna kick it back to you. Great job, Diane. Okay, our final speaker of the evening is Steve Mika. Steve is the owner and founder of STEM Hand Soap, or Handmade, sorry, Hand Soap. Um, all right, ready, set, go, Steve. All right, now I suppose you can hear me. I'm ready. Hi, I'm Steve Mika. I am the co-owner of STEM Handmade Soap, and uh, we make all natural bath and body products um, and skincare products using all natural ingredients. Uh, in our store uh, soap studio uh, here in Lakewood and we've had our store open for about seven years now and over this the course of those seven years we've taken a lot of risk small business is risky business and not just from the day-to-day -day operations but from the long-term strategy planning that goes on as well you really never know what the outcome is going to be but if you don't take that risk you won't have an outcome so with those challenges, um, if you don't take those challenges and treat them as opportunities, um, you'll never know really how far you could go. So we do take a look at all of our, our challenges as opportunities. How can we get past this, through this, and continue to grow um, and be relevant um, here in Cleveland? 
So a lot has changed um, over the years. We started making soap in the basement of our house uh, and just selling soap with an online presence. And people really liked the fact that our product was all natural, our soaps, and said, hey, do you make an all natural lotion? And we were like, no, but we could. Um, so we added lotion. Um, and as people started loving our product, they, just, they kept on asking for more and more product. And deciding to add product to the line is a risk because you're investing in more ingredients, more of your time, packaging, um, and you never really know when you start taking that risk what the outcome, outcome is going to be. Um, so we find that if we just stay true to our brand, um, the good results will follow. And so far that's worked well for us, um, even though we've taken a lot of risks uh, to get there. So as our business grew, um, we started running out of room in our basement and needed to find uh, a space where we could manufacture our, our soaps and our lotions and our skincare products um, with, with more space and with better efficiency. Uh, so that was a big risk that we took um, and we weren't sure where we wanted to do that. We wanted to stay in Lakewood. We live in Lakewood. We love Lakewood. And we took a huge risk seven years ago to buy a building in the Birdtown Historic District. Not a lot was happening back then. Um, so that's why it was a big risk. Will people find us? Will people feel safe? Um, and it was the perfect spot for us. The other risk that was there, it had a small retail space in the front of the building. And it wasn't part of our original plan, but hey, why not? So we spent some time fixing up the building that was there and we opened up a small uh, retail space in the front of the building. So the rewards of taking those risks is a lot has changed in Birdtown over the past several years. Um, and our business is really benefiting from that. There's a lot happening as you can see from the pictures and a lot that's gonna happen in the coming years. So we are feeling really confident that the risk that we took um, were really good for us. So as we grow, we had to hire more employees. And what, something that was very important to us was that we offered above market range uh, salaries to our employees um, and offered benefits. A big risk, because we didn't know if the business could support that. Um, but what we, what we have found out over the years is that uh, the business could support it because we had employees who believed in the business and treat it as if it was their own business. Um, and that has been our biggest asset over the past seven years um, in the retail uh, business, selling our soaps and lotions to you um, and your neighbors uh, throughout Lakewood and the Cleveland community. So about two years ago, we were approached um, from a developer in uh, Shaker Heights, wanted to know if we wanted to open up a second location. And that was a big risk because we weren't sure if we were ready. Um, I was still working a full-time a job uh, in corporate America. And it would mean I'd have to leave a career that I built, loved uh, with all my heart for 30 years um, to grow our business um, in the handmade soap uh, industry. So the day we signed the lease for a second location, um, I gave my notice and two weeks later, um, I was owner of a soap shop um, and my life changed dramatically. Now I, I really needed to make sure uh, the risks I took paid off. So now we were able to add additional product lines. Uh, recently, we added a full, full face care line. We were able to spend a little bit more time on marketing the product, which has really paid off. And most importantly, spending time on the business and really looking at those metrics that really help us grow. We all know the past several months uh, have been a challenge for everyone, and it's forced us to take a lot of risk in how we operate our stores in, uh, inside our stores, how we operate our website. Um, we actually make changes to our website almost every single week to adapt to what's happening out there in the community. Um, and we've been met with uh, a lot of love uh, from our customers who continue to want to shop our stores and have great experiences um, trying new products um, and keeping their hands clean, which is very important. Uh, so now how do we grow and how do we remain, remain relevant? We don't know. Um, but for holiday season this year, we are taking a lot of risks because we have no idea what life will be like. Um, in December, shoppers can't shop elbow to elbow in our stores this year. 
Um, so how do we adapt to make sure that we are successful? Um, so change is going to be inevitable. Take those risks, treat those risks as uh, opportunities, um, and then really uh, let benefit from the rewards. Um, because if you change and adapt rapidly, um, you can and it will. So thank you. Steve, thank you for sharing that business story. Boy, you went through about every tough decision that a small business potentially could have to make. Uh, you know, going to your first retail location and then uh, how you want to treat your staff, realizing that people are really the most important thing oftentimes when you're growing a business and then the big change from your job in corporate America. So thank you for sharing that. That was great to hear that journey. We really appreciate you sharing that. Um, Patty, I don't, I don't know if you can chat in. Do we have a fourth door prize or is that the end? Do we have room for one more trivia question? What do, what do you think? We'll look here on the chat. Um, we do. We have a fourth door prize. So go ahead okay. with one more question. I'm going to do a bonus question. And I've noticed on the chat, so the movie came out in 1983. So that was what, um, 37 years ago? So some of our um, uh, attendees um, might not have been born when the movie came out. Uh, so I'm going to give a little plug to the Lakewood Public Library. Andrea Fisher's from the library. She's our host. And in prepping for these trivia questions, I went to the library and got the DVD out uh, for free. So they've got, I think, two copies of the main branch and one, one copy of Madison. And it's a lot of big stars in the movie. And um, if you haven't seen the movie, um, the library, Lakewood Library is still doing business. Drive through the drive through or stop in and get the DVD. Um, okay, last trivia question. Um, so the get ready to put in your question or your answers here. So as I mentioned, uh, Tom Cruise's character Joel trashes the Porsche. It falls into Lake Michigan, and he has to get it uh, fixed up um, before his parents get home. So he has the ingenious, risky business idea um, to basically run an escort business out of his parents' house. Um, so that is a part of the movie that um, I'll, I'll make a little side comment here. Uh, when, when I watched it and prepping for this, I ended up watching it with my high school son. And um, so that made for some interesting scenes in the movie. But, um, but he's, um, here's the final trivia question. So while he's, he's running this risky business out of his parents' home and they're out of town, a college representative comes into the house uh, to do an interview for him. It's a prestigious school. What school is it? There's a college representative that comes in to interview him to potentially get into this prestigious school. It's not yet a uh, Princeton. We got Princeton. Melinda Frank is the winner. Princeton is the prestigious school that um, uh, someone comes in to interview him while he's running this extremely risky business out of his parents' home. Um, so if you want to know how it turns out, go to the library, get the movie, and um, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you, everyone, for playing trivia. And if you did win, uh, Melinda, congratulations on winning. Please chat in your address so that uh, Patty can make sure to get you your prize. So for our four winners, go ahead and chat in your address so we can get the prizes out to you. And that's all I got for today, guys. Thanks for attending. All the speakers did a wonderful job.